live, but mostly recorded, digitized and distributed for your listening and learning pleasure. It's Mostly Accurate Lectures with Professor Mitchell, the series that answers the questions you might not have cared to ask. Professor Mitchell is an Associate Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Psychologist who specializes in questionable, sarcastic comments and failures to return emails. So sit back, relax, pay attention, and ask yourself, Are you ready? We need to begin by defining what is learning. Learning and conditioning are oftentimes used interchangeably. And for the intents and purposes of this particular section, they are relatively interchangeable. Learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior due to experience. That experience can be something that someone actually uh, engages in, or it can be cognitive learning, such as reading a book or listening to a lecture. The change in behavior due to that experience primarily comes from the fact that a person can no longer re-experience something for the first time and therefore they're never going to act on that initial experience again. They're always going to react with the new information that they have. Using a term that we'll later understand a little bit better, the stimulus to the new experience can never be neutral after the first time that it's experienced. When we're looking at classical conditioning, the individual that we're going to first study is a gentleman by the name of Ivan Pavlov, a late 1800, early 1900 Russian physiologist who is credited with discovering classical or otherwise known as respondent conditioning. The classical conditioning that came about from Pavlov's uh, experiments were derived from experience uh, that Pavlov had with his lab assistants when they were trying to determine how much saliva dogs produced when presented with a stimuli of food. The saliva or drooling that came from the dogs was a reflexive act. They didn't need to learn that they were going to drool if food was presented to them. The stimuli was the food, the drooling was the response, and it was relatively reflexive. So we need to understand some of the classic concepts that are, are in classical conditioning. The two biggest terms that you need to understand are response and stimuli. Stimuli is what acts on the organism that's being conditioned, and response is the behavior that is directly correlated to the stimulus. So in the situation with Pavlov's uh, dogs, meat or food was presented to the dog, which is a stimulus, it's acting upon the dog, and the response was for them to drool or salivate. It is something that they did in direct response to the stimulus. These are considered to be unconditioned stimuli and responses. Dogs from the age of a puppy to the age of an old dog are going to do the same thing when presented with food that they like. The stimulus is food, the response is drooling or panting or showing some form of desire. No learning needs to occur for this to, uh, to occur uh, in the dog. On the other hand, conditioned learning is when the stimulus and response are paired with an unconditioned stimulus which elicits an unconditioned response. Now remember that term, elicit. An unconditioned stimulus, an unlearned stimulus, elicits an unconditioned response, which means that it brings about with no prior learning. The, uh, the stimulus, the learned stimulus, will bring about a response after the conditioning has been acquired. So acquisition has to take place for a conditioned stimulus and response relationship, whereas an unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response are elicited. In this scenario, we can ring a bell right when the dog is seeing or sensing the meat or the food that is being given. And so those two things become paired. 
prior to any pairing, if you were to just ring a bell in front of a dog, they're not going to necessarily do anything. They may pay attention, they're going to hear it, but they're not going to do anything in regards to digestion. And so ringing a bell in this respect is a neutral stimulus. You pair the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned or unlearned stimulus of food and eventually the dog starts to see that these two things are related. Once the dog automatically responds the same way to the bell as the dog does to the food, then acquisition has occurred and the bell has gone from being a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus, which brings about a conditioned response. You ring the bell, the dog starts to drool. And so as we can see, many different things are actually going to be uh, brought about by classical conditioning. We experience an unpleasant uh, environment at the dentist and so anytime we think about the dentist or we go to the dentist we start to automatically have unpleasant experiences. We see a truck that is playing um, jingling music uh, going down the road and we automatically assume that there's ice cream and we start to have hunger pangs for ice cream. These are classically conditioned behaviors. So let's walk through this one more time. Before conditioning, the dog doesn't respond at all to the bell. During conditioning, with the food, which is unconditioned, and the dog drools. The dog, is, the dog is not drooling to the bell, the dog is drooling to the unconditioned stimulus, which is the, the dog food. Times of putting those two things together, the conditioned stimulus, the former neutral stimulus, the bell, is presented and the dog drools because of the uh, combining that has happened, the conditioning that has happened. The concepts of generalization and discrimination are the extent to which the conditioned stimulus is bigger or smaller or the same as the original uh, neutral stimulus. What that means is, um, if in the uh, example that we just showed, if the exact bell with the exact same tone was required to get the dog to drool, but if a different bell, like a bell from a church tower, um, was rung and the dog didn't drool, that would be discrimination. It's very discriminating to the tone of the bell. But if any bell tone makes the dog drool, that's a generalization. So, for example, if you were walking home from school one day and a large black and brown Rottweiler came running after you, you would experience physiological fear and you would start to run. That is going to be something that is probably going to be classically conditioned in you that if you see a dog uh, as you're on your walk home, you're going to start to feel a little anxious and you may even start to run without even the dog approaching you. If the dog uh, that you see the next day is another Rottweiler and you have the same reaction, we don't know whether you've generalized or discriminated. However, if you see a, a chihuahua on the way home and you start to have the same physiological reaction and you run away, you have generalized to almost all dogs that you are scared of it. Uh, but if you see a Doberman the next day and you're fine, well then you've discriminated down to a very specific dog, um, a specific breed and a specific look. So how do we get rid of these classically conditioned behaviors? Well, we need to start with the idea that once something is conditioned, it can never go back to being neutral, but the conditioned stimulus may not bring about the conditioned response uh, as readily. And what happens is, if we were to go back to our initial experiment with the dog and the bell, we ring the bell, we give the dog food, and that, that classically conditioned behavior and response are pretty strong. However, if we go for two or three months where we just walk around and ring the bell in front of the dog, but never give it um, the unconditioned stimulus of the food along with it, eventually that uh, correlation is going to go away. That process is called extinction. As you give the conditioned stimulus by itself, you just ring the bell, but you don't give the dog any payoff, eventually it's going to stop, it's going to slowly start to stop salivating until it's pretty much gone. Now, what we need to be really careful with with these things is that what will happen is out of nowhere, 
spontaneous recovery occurs. And the conditioned stimulus, the ringing bell alone, uh, just automatically brings back this uh, conditioned response. In a little bit, we're going to talk about conditioned emotional responses. And where we see that very frequently is with phobias. So think about if you had a phobia to dogs, uh, the, the aforementioned, you know, Doberman, but we presented you with Doberman after Doberman after Doberman and they never chased you. So your fear started to go through extinction, but five years down the road, you see a Doberman along the road and you just start freaking out. It's not because uh, that particular dog may have been startling. It was because spontaneous recovery occurred and the, the conditioned stimulus brought back the conditioned response out of nowhere. Remember, spontaneous means that it came out of nowhere. Recovery means that it's coming back. And if we look at extinction, just think about the dinosaurs. Eventually they went away just like our conditioned response goes away to the conditioned stimulus if we stop pairing it with the unconditioned stimulus. So finally, we're going to talk about conditioned emotional responses. We've already mentioned that a lot of uh, phobias are actually caused by CERs, but I want to walk through this step by step. It's not significantly different than regular conditioned responses, but it's purely emotional. So in this scenario, we have an individual who is kissing another individual. And the response, the physiological response, is going to be a racing heart, um, maybe sweaty palms, excitement. The kiss is going to lead to a racing heart. This will happen even with somebody who's not all that romantically interested in the other person. Um, you know, we, we tend to think that people who are kissing are, are going to be somewhat romantically interested in each other, but the kiss may not uh, be a result of strong romantic interest. It'll still have the racing heart. However, even if they're not all that interested in each other, if you had the kiss that led to the racing heart, then later you see the same person, you're going to then have the conditioned emotion response of sight of the person leading to the racing heart. It's not the fact that you're expecting a kiss, it's not even the, the, the fact that you may um, still have that same feeling for the person that you had at the very beginning, but the sight of that individual will lead to a racing heart. Before anybody gets really excited about how great this is, there is a, a, another side to it in that if you are having a bad experience with somebody, if you're having a fight with somebody and you get angry, so instead of um, kissing leading to a racing heart, um, arguing leads to anger. And so the sight of that individual is automatically going to give you uh, anger because you're seeing them and you're being reminded of the, the bad uh, feelings that you had while you were fighting. So while these things can be good, sometimes they can backfire on us. Now that we understand the basic concepts of classical conditioning, let's try it out together. Watch the following video and try to identify what the neutral stimulus is, what the unconditioned stimulus is, and what the conditioned stimulus and responses are. After viewing the video, take a moment and try to answer the following questions. 
what is the neutral stimulus, what is the unconditioned stimulus, and what is the unconditioned response. Obviously, there would be two other questions here that you could ask yourself, which is, what is the conditioned stimulus and what is the conditioned response? Take a moment and try to answer these questions for yourself. In this situation, the neutral stimulus is the sound that the computer is making. Jim clicks a button and it makes a universal chime that plays through the speaker system. When Dwight hears this initially, he has no particular response to it. While he does perceive it, and he does hear that there's a problem with the computer, it makes no association with mints or his breath or anything of the like. What is the unconditioned stimulus? The unconditioned stimulus here is a couple of different things, and we have to be careful to identify what is the behavior that's being manipulated. Since Jim is trying to get Dwight to expect a mint every time that he uh, rings the bell, the unconditioned stimulus is actually his offer of the mint. You don't need to learn that if someone offers you something that you can accept it. And so the unconditioned or unlearned responses, Dwight accepts it. Are there other unconditioned uh, stimuli and unconditioned responses? Yes. Uh, if we want to go a step deeper, the fact that Dwight develops uh, a, a, a for lack of a better term, an understanding or uh, an observance of the fact that his mouth is dry and has a bad taste to it is secondary to the fact that he now realizes that he wants a mint. He's expecting that the mint will, will take away this bad taste in his mouth and when he doesn't get that payoff, he immediately starts to notice it. So the neutral stimulus, again, is the chime the neutral stimulus is always going to transition to be the conditioned stimulus. So the conditioned stimulus is the computer chime. Remember, the unconditioned response is that Dwight is accepting the offer. The unconditioned stimulus is a, a, a Jim offers him a mint. The unconditioned response is that he, uh, in turn, makes the socially appropriate thing to accept the offer. Once he hears the bell, the conditioned stimulus, he then puts his hand out expecting there to be an offer, however there is no offer. This is almost identical to Pavlov's original study in that dogs hear the bell and then they are presented with food over and over and over. After acquisition occurs, then the dogs start to salivate because of the expectation that the food is going to follow. When Dwight puts out his hand, he's expecting the mint and it doesn't come from Jim because he actually did not make that official offer.